Hi, it's Matt here from Go Green Autos. So this video is like a beginner's guide or a quick start guide to the Nissan Leaf 40 kilowatt hour. So if you've recently purchased one of these, hopefully from Go Green Autos, then this video will give you the basics so you can get in and start using it straight away without maybe reading the user manual. So in this video, I'm not going to go into great depth in the multimedia system, the buttons, the menus and all the technology in the car. Otherwise, the video will be too long. This is more just about the basics so you can just operate the car, uh, charge it and uh, tips on how you drive it. So first off, the keys. These are wireless keys. You just need to keep the key in your pocket or handbag. You don't need to use the buttons on the key just keep that on you and then when you come to the car to unlock you just press the rubber button on either of the doors and that then that unlocks it and again when you leave the car to lock it just push the rubber button there on the door as long as the key is with you that will work and the vehicle detects when the key is inside or outside the vehicle and when you're inside the vehicle again you just keep the key in your pocket you put your foot on the foot brake and push the start button there to make the vehicle start. You've got to give it a good three or four seconds to allow the vehicle to boot up. And when it is ready to go, you get that green light there on the dash and all EVs have this green go light. It's a picture of a car with arrows at the bottom showing that the car can move backwards or forwards because obviously there's no engine, there's no noise and vibration. The car just switches on. So this is the symbol to tell you that the car is on and ready to drive. If you get a menu up on the dash to say it can't detect the key, that is because the battery is probably getting low or gone flat inside the key. So obviously just change the coin battery in here. But if you're out and about and you need to start the car, hold the key over the start stop button there when you push it. If you hold the key close, and then push the button, it will probably start just fine. So next, your gear selector here. So um, electric vehicles don't have gearboxes, uh, but they give you a automatic gear selector. So it all sort of feels familiar. So you drive them like an auto. However, in the Leaf, they have redesigned the traditional gear selector um, gear stick to uh, a knob. Um, but it still operates the same. So it gives you a little picture here to show you um, the movement of it. So park is across here. So to go reverse, you go across and up and to go to drive, you go across and down. So this is all very light. Uh, I frequently see people get in and grabbing hold of this to move it very, um, put a lot of force into it, but it's very simple. You just cross and down for drive, across and up for reverse and you press P there to put it into park. It's as simple as that. So before you move this, you must keep your foot on the foot brake. So to start the vehicle, you keep your foot on the foot brake and you keep it on the foot brake before we select drive. So at this point, we've selected drive and up here on the dash, it shows, it shows you a D there to show you're in drive. And then you release the handbrake and then the vehicle will creep and you then drive it like an auto. So next, the handbrake. There are two types of handbrake on these 40 kilowatt hour leafs. If you've got the electric handbrake, you'll have a switch just here to operate the handbrake. But this one has got the manual handbrake, uh, the same as the 24 and 30 kilowatt hour leafs. And it's actually a foot operated brake. And that foot brake is this additional pedal down here where your clutch would be. And you just put your foot on it and push it down to release it, you'll hear it click and then it will spring back up. And when you want to put the handbrake down, put your foot on it, the pedal will be up here and push it down. It's very simple to use, but uh, first time drivers do struggle to find it. And uh, I think the pedal sits a little bit higher than they expect. So just put your foot up high and you'll feel it with your toes. Um, but apart from that, it operates like the handbrake. Um, but obviously using your foot, it does mean you can put more force on it and they are nice to use. So when you want to stop the car and park up, the key thing to remember is to properly use the handbrake. And on these, because it's got a foot brake and it's out the way, it's quite easy to forget to use it. So when you stop the car, you've obviously got your foot on the normal brakes and you then press P to put it into park. What you should do then is put the handbrake on with your foot 
and then once the handbrake is on and the handbrake has taken the weight of the vehicle particularly if it's on a slope you can then release your foot off the foot brake and then obviously power the car down that's the proper routine of stopping it it's not a good idea just to leave the vehicle in park without the handbrake on well in this case a foot brake because uh, particularly if the car's on a slope you shouldn't do that you should always use the handbrake because you want the weight of the vehicle on the brakes not on the transmission and if it's on particularly steep slopes over time you can break the transmission just by putting the weight of the vehicle on the park and not on the brakes when you put the vehicle into reverse you get the cameras up here so you've got the image out the back on the main screen and then this screen gives you a bird's eye view so this is looking at the car and it stitches all the four camera images together to make it look like effectively there's a drone looking over the top of the car so you've got your image out the front image out the back and images around the side and this is particularly useful when you're parking the car in a public car park where you've got white lines and you'll be able to see the white lines down the sides of the sides of the car and uh, you can really line up the car in the space properly even though the white lines might not be visible um, through your mirrors so next i will quickly talk to you about the dash layout there is an awful lot of menus in this dash so um, there's more here than i'm going to show you but anyway this is obviously your speedo that's all straightforward down here is your battery pack your fuel tank effectively we're currently 100 percent uh, charged and then this is the best screen to have up here on this side because this is your power meter and basically this is a bit like a rev counter in an ice vehicle so uh, as you drive this these colored blocks will um, go around here showing you the amount of power that you're using and then it will drop down to this side when it's um, regening and charging the battery so you basically try to keep your um, power consumption in the eco band to drive efficiently if you obviously want to drive the vehicle as efficiently as you can um, and then in the middle is your estimated range but you have to bear in mind this is always an estimate and it's based on recent driving history so if you drive fast one day and drive uneconomically then the next day it's going to show an artificially low range doesn't mean that's the range you're going to get but it's obviously based on history so you have to take this with a big pinch of salt but looking at this screen here we can see down here we've got four dots down the side and that means there are four screens available so you use the arrows here to toggle down between the different screens so what we've got here is our power meter then we toggle to um, showing you the battery and charge times and then we go down here to battery temperature and then again to battery state of health battery capacity and then you can use the left and right arrows to move between different uh, menus along the top and then under each one of those is sub menus like here there's two so this is our driving economy recently we've been driving at three and a half miles per kilowatt hour and then we can sc scroll down there to have an economy history graph um, but there's lots of uh, as you can see here there's one two three four five six seven or six or seven menus and within that there's lots of sub um, menus or screens so there's an awful lot of information you can have up on that screen but that's all controlled by these arrows here the OK button and the back button but as I said first time drivers I think should always have it on this screen because it gives you a feel of how your how pressing the accelerator uses the power and will encourage you to drive more economically so uh, now let's talk about how you drive an electric vehicle so obviously um, you want to drive an electric vehicle efficiently because you want to um, maximize the range of the vehicle because generally they do have lower range than a uh, petrol or diesel vehicle um, so to drive them efficiently you've basically got to drive them gently um, be a bit more gentle with your right foot on your accelerator accelerate more gently but ultimately you want to capitalize on the regeneration system on electric vehicle so basically how that works is when you're accelerating you're putting electricity into the motor the motor is spinning in this case the front wheels and you're going along 
as soon as you lift off the accelerator, that motor is still spinning because the vehicle's going forward and obviously it's connected to the wheels. So instantly that motor turns into a dynamo and starts generating electricity and putting it back into your battery pack. And you want to capitalize on that because that's charging your battery as you're slowing down. That's why this screen is useful because that information is displayed on this screen. So as you're slowing down, you'll see the power meter drop into the regen section, which shows you you're putting energy back into the battery pack. So you want to capitalize on that. So basically what that means is when you're coming up to a corner, junction, roundabout, traffic lights or whatever, that you need to slow down, you lift off the accelerator much, much sooner than you would do with uh, your ice vehicle and coast. And while the vehicle is coasting and slowing down, you're charging the battery. So the longer you can do that, the more power you're going to put back into the battery, which extends your range. If you lift off the accelerator and immediately slam on the brakes to slow down, you've wasted that kinetic energy that you could have put back in the battery into friction and heat in your brake pads. You're going to wear your brake pads out unnecessarily. You're going to get brake dust on the wheels, which you've only got to clean. And it's also bad for the environment. And you're going to see poor range. So you basically lift off the accelerator much, much sooner and coast as much as you can. And while you're coasting, the battery is charging. And it makes for more pleasurable driving, but it does take a while to get used to. And on the Nissan Leaf, the regen effect is quite gentle. So you really do lift off probably four times longer than you would do with your previous vehicle and just allow the vehicle to roll. So now let's talk about the regenerative braking. So it's called braking, but it's got nothing to do with braking. As I said, it's just slowing down on the electric motor. So on the leaf, there are two levels of regen. So as standard, when you're in drive mode and you get the D up there on the dash, the regen braking effect is very light. It it takes a long time for the vehicle to slow down and obviously you're you're getting uh, energy back in the battery but not to a great extent you can put it into b mode and you can see that it says d and b b mode is braking mode and it increases the level of regen and to put it into b mode you just toggle it down to the same position again and you can see now the dash has changed to b and what you can do is you can just change that while you're driving and we can see there it's changing up there on the screen so what you do is leave it in D and if you're coming up to a corner and you've lifted off but the car's not slowing down enough, before you go and hit the foot brake to slow down you drop it into B and that increases the regen braking effect um, so it makes the car slow down a bit quicker because ultimately as I said you want to resist using the brakes if you can. So that increases your level of regen, but again, on the leaf, it is still quite light. So a lot of people just keep it in B mode all the time. But actually, to drive most efficiently, you want to coast as much as you can rather than strong regen. Um, but that takes, that takes a different style of driving, so it takes people quite a while to get used to that. But um, So most people would keep it in B most of the time, but toggling between D and B as I said is something you do while you're driving so to drive it most efficiently you drive it in D and then use B when you're coming into corners where you haven't lifted off soon enough and you need that bit of extra braking effect and Nissan Leafs have always done it like that having a D and B however in both modes the regen uh, braking effect is very very light and a lot of other cars have much stronger regen and uh, some of them when the regen is very strong they have what's called one pedal driving because the regen effect is so strong that you never take your foot off the accelerator uh, because you never need to go for the brakes because it slows down quick enough. So the Leaf, the 40 kilowatt hour Leafs have introduced this e-pedal system and that's basically one pedal driving. It's regen braking to the max. So to put it into e-pedal, you push the switch down and then you see e-pedal enabled up there. And what that is, as I said, is really strong regen. Um, and it's very nice, but it takes people a long time to get used to. So I would suggest as a new driver, don't use it initially. Uh, get used to using D and B mode and then um, 
as you've got used to that a little bit try one pedal one pedal is nice because it is genuinely one pedal driving and uh, when you lift off the accelerator the vehicle will slow down a very quick uh, the reason why i say uh, get used to the other modes first is because actually e-pedal is um, too strong a regen for a lot of new EV drivers because when you lift off the accelerator the vehicle will really slow down quickly um, to get the most out of it what you actually do is not lift off the accelerator as you're coming to a corner or a bend or whatever or a junction and you want to slow down just feather your foot off the accelerator slightly don't lift it all the way off because you'll find the vehicle will slow down too quickly um, and in, there are some cases where that actually results in inefficient driving. But anyway, um, ultimately, when you get used to the car, you'll probably keep it in e-pedal and just drive on the accelerator. And in e-pedal mode, you will find you will never need to go for the brakes. E-pedal is a little bit different to other electric cars because it actually does apply brakes as well. That's why ultimately it's not as efficient as getting used to this and just driving more gently. But with the e-pedal system, it allows you to drive the car probably like you did with your previous petrol or diesel vehicle. You're coming up to a junction, you lift off the accelerator, and rather than going to the brakes, you would just let the car slow down. And you're going to get regen, but actually the car is applying some brakes as well at lower speed. So it's not the most efficient driving, but it's easy driving. But as I said, if you can just lift off the accelerator more gently then you can get very efficient driving with the e-pedal mode um, ultimately it's all about trying to drive without using the brakes because if you use the brakes you're throwing away that kinetic energy into friction and heat rather than putting it into the battery and um, e-pedal does use braking so you're far better just to drive more gently and more conservatively and lift off the accelerator sooner and do lots of coasting than relying on the uh, e-pedal or, or the brakes to slow down. But all of that will probably take a little bit of while to get used to because it does mean you have to change your driving habits. But if you get in one of these and just drive it like you did your previous uh, petrol or diesel car, then it's all fine. It's just you're not going to get the best economy out of it. And therefore, you're going to see lower range than you uh, could do if you drove it efficiently. So next, let's talk about eco mode. We've got a switch here for eco mode. And when it's turned on, we can see there the green eco uh, light there up there in the display. So eco mode limits the power to the electric motor and ultimately it just makes you drive more gently it changes the mapping of the accelerator pedal as well uh, it makes it feel like the vehicle's driving in treacle um, but that makes it sound worse than it actually is so i would suggest all new owners drive in eco when you get the vehicle and you get used to it um, so it does make it feel a little bit slower, but actually EVs feel slow anyway. And that's because there's no noise or drama when you're accelerating. And what I tend to find is people will get in an EV, new people who've never driven an EV before, will get in an EV and drive it much faster than they would normally drive their ICE vehicle. And that's because they're really quiet, really smooth, and you don't get the same feeling of speed. So people will generally drive an EV 15 to 20 miles an hour faster well, they think they're, they're, you know, if you're driving this at um, 50, it feels like 30, basically. You don't get the same feeling of speed. And, and because of that, people drive them much faster, use more fuel, electricity, and don't see the range because they're bombing around. Eco mode will put it in about the same power of, as your previous car. So if you start in eco mode and get used to it, it all helps you just drive it more efficiently and just a bit more gently but at any time you can take it out of eco mode while you're driving you can do this um, on the go so um, so generally yes i would keep it in eco all the time the times where you might want to take it out of eco is in the winter on a cold morning if you haven't preconditioned the car um, eco mode reduces the power to the heating and air conditioning system so with electric vehicles they are less efficient in the winter because your heating system uses a lot of power and it will reduce your range so eco helps on that a little bit by reducing the power 
to the heating system. So the only things that uses power from the big traction battery is the electric motor which drives the car and the heating system. So as I said, this reduces the power to the motor. It also reduces the power to the heater to preserve range and makes you drive more efficiently, more economically. So um, there are times if you want maximum heating or maximum air conditioning, you would take it out of Eco just to make this work uh, 100%. Or if you want to overtake or um, if you're on a motorway or dual carriageway and you want to drive at 70 miles an hour, then you would then take it out of Eco as well because Eco will limit your top speed. So I think I'll leave um, driving and controls there because there's an awful lot I could go into about uh, driving the vehicle and getting the most out of all the technology but you can read the user manual for the rest of it the only other thing i quickly will mention is the heating system because some people come to these cars uh, and haven't had climate control before so to use the heating basically you turn it on there you set your desired temperature up here and press auto and just let the vehicle do its thing it will maintain the car at the temperature you have set. Uh, if you adjust anything, fan speed or pressing mode changes where the air is going to come out, whether it's on the screen in your face or down on your feet, as soon as you adjust anything it takes eco off. Um, so eco, um, sorry not eco, auto. So auto just keeps everything automatic. All you do is set the temperature and nothing else. It will sort out where the air's got to go and at what speed the fan needs to go at. Um, so it's best just to leave it on auto and allow it to do its thing. The Leaf does have a heat pump so it is uh, as efficient as they can get but still the heating will reduce the range. So I've got the heating on here and the heat is being applied because uh, we've got it on at 18 and a half degrees and we can see up there the estimated range has dropped again it's only estimating it but it is showing that we're going to see a less range with the heating on if i turn the heating off we can see there the range jumps up by nine miles it's it's only a guess but that gives you some idea of how much energy the heating system is using air conditioning does use less energy than heating though so you can bear that in mind so in the summer you don't really have to limit your air conditioning use um, because it doesn't make a huge difference in the, in the range but uh, what makes the biggest difference is to precondition the car so this is a nice function that electric vehicles have and you can tell it tell the dash what time you want to leave in the morning and while the vehicle is connected to your charger it will switch on and precondition the cabin so in the winter it will put the heating on melt the ice off the windows if it's a particularly frosty morning and get the vehicle ready for that time you have set so when you disconnect from the charger you still got 100% battery 100% range but your cabin is already warmed up so therefore you can maybe do your drive without the heating on at all and that's a much more efficient way of getting the maximum range out of the car in the winter uh, the uh, 40 kilowatt hour leafs the the end connector uh, what the, the spec this car is and the techna models get heated seats and heated leather steering wheel so here we've got heated seats both sides we've also got heated seats in the back and we've got here the heated steering wheel switch there to warm the steering wheel and that is a very efficient way of heating yourself uh, in the winter so um, the heated seats heated steering wheel uses the 12 volt battery up front it doesn't take power from the traction battery so it's a lot more efficient so to get maximum range in the winter precondition the car while it's connected to the charger and then when you're in you can probably turn the heating off completely and from that point onwards use your heated seats and heated steering wheel or maybe turn the heating down and use these and it genuinely does work just heating your hands and your bum really does keep you warm um, and that's the most efficient way of uh, preserving range in the winter and preconditioning also works in the summer instead of heating the vehicle it cools the vehicle so it'll put the air conditioning on and cool the vehicle down to a comfortable level uh, when you get in. Obviously at that point you're not going to use heated seats or heated steering wheel so you'll probably still use the air conditioning 
but at least the majority of the work has been done while the vehicle is connected to the uh, wall charger. To get to the settings to do your preconditioning, again, use the buttons here to go to the menus and you go along to the settings, which is the furthest one on the right, and go down to uh, EV settings, I think. Yes, there it is, climate control timer one. And you can put there the times you want the um, climate control to come on the climate control timer and the days of the week so for most people it will be Monday to Friday sort of eight o'clock or whatever time you want to leave to do your drive to work and the vehicle will be ready for that time while we're in this screen I'll just do a back there we can see here at the top two are charge timers that's the other quick thing I'll mention is if you want to schedule your overnight charging to match a cheap rate nighttime uh, electricity tariff like uh, Octopus Go, for example, that's where you set your overnight charging times in that screen there. So next, let's talk about charging. To open the charge port at the front, you push that button there, which uh, looks a bit like a petrol pump, but it's got an electrical connector on the end, a plug on the end. But you also get the same button there on your key, the bottom button. And then that releases the charge port at the front here. And here you have two charge ports. The orange one is AC charging, which is basically slow charging. And the left one is DC charging which is rapid charging so ac power is what we have in our buildings so, so all home charging workplace charging and and a lot of uh, public charging in car parks and supermarkets and things will be ac slow charging dc requires a lot of equipment so you have dc charging in petrol forecourts and motorway services and when you're doing a trip when you want to get that rapid in this case half an hour to an hour charge it's dc but for majority of your charging it will be on ac which is typically um, overnight charging while you sleep so in the back of the car you will probably have two charge cables you will have a portable charger often called a granny cable and that allows you to charge the vehicle on a three pin plug and you will have a standard type two to type two AC charging cable, which you use to connect into a, a wall charger. So let's talk about the granny cable first, because this is probably will be the first way you will charge the car because you probably haven't had a, got a wall box installed yet. So these are slow purposely because you can't put the sort of load you require to charge an EV through a three pin plug and through your um, existing main socket and wiring. So these are purposely reduced to 10 amp. So at 10 amp, an EV will only charge at about eight or nine miles an hour. So a vehicle like this with a 40 kilowatt hour battery is gonna take about 18 hours to charge using a uh, granny cable or its correct name is a portable charger but at least that would get you going initially until you get your wall charger installed so to use these you plug this end into a socket uh, it's best always to make the cable live before you plug it into the car so plug this end switch it on and you'll get the ready light go on and then you take this end take the rubber cap off and you put this end into the charge socket there and you see there it did try to lock it and attempt to start charging um, your charge cables do get locked to the car while it's charging it stops anyone from uh, pulling them out and the vehicle will control the charger so when the vehicle's got to 100 percent it will turn this off so you can just plug it in and leave it however if you have an electric vehicle, particularly one with the size of battery that this has got, then you're going to get a wall charger installed. And this is when you would use uh, this charging cable. It has a type to this end and all home chargers, work chargers and public AC charging posts have this connector. So this goes into the charger. And again, we've got the same connector here, which goes into the car there. So when charging with a proper wall charger, uh, which are typically 7 kilowatt, the vehicle is going to charge at 6.6 .6 kilowatts. That means a full charge from 0 to 100% is only going to take about 7 hours, which is typically overnight. 
but it does mean that that charge rate is then obviously much faster. You're going to get about 21, 22 miles an hour, whereas you're only getting eight or nine miles an hour using the granny cable. You do want to keep this cable in the car though when you've finished with it at home. Um, coil it back up, chuck it in the boot, because if you're out and about and want to use a public charging post, then you're going to need your cable. But when using the rapid charger, a DC rapid charger, you don't need a cable because the cable and connector is always on the charger because that delivers 50 kilowatt and therefore the cable has to be about that thick. So you don't need anything when you're rapid charging, that's always on the charging unit. You just need to get your cable when you're slow charging. So the sat nav in the car will identify where public charging points are, but uh, you can also use an app on your phone. Uh, I tend to use ZapMap, but you can also use a plug share. And the apps on your phone tends to always be more update and more thorough than the information in the car. So I just use ZapMap and that identifies all the public chargers. So when you want to find a, a rapid charger, this is what's called a CHAdeMO connector. So you can filter the chargers in the ZapMap app to only show CHAdeMO charging points and that will show where your nearest ones are and all the information about um, prices and what network they're on and it also now does routing as well so you can use it to plan your uh, longer routes and uh, charging stops. So let's just jump back to range, just have a quick conversation about range again. So as I said your range estimation is here but you've got to treat that with a big pinch of salt because that's based on recent driving history um, and there's lots of things that can affect range so primarily speed is what's going to have the biggest effect on range just like a petrol or diesel however electric vehicles are a bit different to ice vehicles an ice vehicle is most efficient at sort of 50 60 miles an hour driving they're not very efficient at stop start driving it's the complete opposite with an electric vehicle they are most efficient with uh, city and town driving and rural road driving where the average speed is much lower and there's lots of slowing down and stopping because all the time you're slowing down you're recharging the battery with the regenerative braking effect on the motor um, where they're not uh, good well where they're less efficient is when you're doing long distance motorway driving because when you get up on a motorway you're generally driving at let's say 70 miles an hour and you're doing that for a very long time with usually very little slowing down, certainly usually no braking. So it's constant exhausting the power out of the battery and you're getting very little back. So they are generally inefficient doing motorway driving, much more efficient doing local stop start driving. And that's why this range meter could be uh, a bit inaccurate sometimes because uh, let's say for example the day before you were doing a high speed drive and then you've charged overnight and the next day it's going to be basing your range on that high speed driving but you might just be potting around locally and that's where this won't be showing the um, true uh, realistic range because it doesn't know how you're going to drive that day. So the range of the vehicle is based on the size of the battery, which is your fuel tank, in this case it's a 40 kilowatt hour battery. These have about 36 kilowatt hours of usable space. And then it's based on your driving efficiency. So you can use the menus here to go down to um, your driving efficiency. Now I'm on the wrong screen there, we've got to go across and go to that screen, the little um, leaf symbol and then up to driving efficiency there. So this is our uh, efficiency meter. We've averaged 3.5 miles per kilowatt hour since this was last reset. You can press the OK button there to reset it. But this is going to show you your efficiency. So generally driving in the summer you want to achieve about four and a half miles per kilowatt hour and uh, so four and a half miles per kilowatt hour with a 38 kilowatt hours of usable space will give you a range of 171 miles if you're driving in a city or town and much lower average speed lots of stop start driving then in the summer if you drive this efficiently you can get um, 
you, you, it's possible you could get five miles per kilowatt hour on average. And at five miles per kilowatt hour times 38 is 190 miles of range. So that's about the maximum you can get on one of these if you drive it very efficiently. 4.5 miles per kilowatt hour is usually the more um, sort of average driving most people will achieve. And then if you drive at four miles per kilowatt hour, hour on average, it will be 152 mile range. Um, this has got 3.5 because this hasn't been uh, driven much recently, so uh, we can pretty much ignore that. In fact, I'm going to do a reset there by holding down the OK button and it's reset it. So um, winter driving, uh, three and a half miles per kilowatt hour is the sort of typical average, and that will give you a range of 133 uh, miles. So that's uh, what you would sort of expect very cold winters with the heating on you might be down nearer three miles per kilowatt hour but as a general rule aim for three and a half in the winter four and a half in the summer so one final thing i'll just mention is um, if you're new to electric vehicles it's very easy to forget to turn it off so as i said you get this green light here to show you that it's running um, but because there's no engine making noise and there's no vibration, when you come to a stop and you finish driving, it feels like the car's off because there's no engine at the front making a racket or vibrating the car. So it's actually quite easy just to open the door and get out, leaving the car running. But of course it beeps at you and it also won't lock. So if you get the beeping, uh, the first thing you've got to check is to see whether you've actually turned it off. So in this case, turn it off, the light goes out, the car's now shut down and then you can exit and lock it as normal.